Well, hi everyone. Um, welcome to another webinar session. This is actually the second of our series, so it is an honor to have you all here for this um, production. My name is Francis Osbage, and I'm one of the co-hosting physicians in this series of um, webinar productions. Of course, let's remind ourselves of the essence of this webinar session. Um, we are actually um, a co-hosting uh, physicians, um, um, not restricted by boundaries, geographic boundaries. And um, our essence here, the importance of this is to actually act as a patient advocate. Normally when um, we have that um, physician-patient interaction, there's a limited time. The patients actually pressed, um, the physicians are pressed with time to have um, meaningful um, discussions with the patients. So this serves as an opportunity to have that, um, to create that forum whereby um, the patients actually, um, we acting as um, the um, patient's advocates um, ask questions in such a way that um, uh, to the specialists that will be, um, mm -hmm. that will pro provide basic information. So today, um, our topic is on kidney failure, the, 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 the truth, the myth, and more. And we have a very distinguished um, panel of guest speakers here. I'll introduce, um, first of all, um, Dr. Venkat Venlaki. Um, he's a consultant nephrologist, head of nephrology and director of transplant nephrology, VPS Healthcare and Virgil Medical City, Abu Dhabi. He's actually um, currently in India and um, we um, are so um, privileged to have him. More of um, introducing Dr. Venlaki. He's recognized as having attained the Royal College of Physicians Canada Accredited Fellowship in Adult Nephrology, University of Toronto, Canada. He's um, uh, also um, attained the American Society of Transplantation Certified Fellowship, Kidney Pancreas Transplantation, Division of Multi-Organ Transplantation, University of Toronto in Canada. Also the American Society of Hypertension, AHHA, Certified Specialist in Clinical Hypertension, is also responsible for publishing 45 published papers in index journals. So um, Dr. Ben Cart, Ben like you, welcome. Could we have our speaker here? It is an honor to have you here. And um, thank you so much because um, he's actually um, coming all the way from India, right? Thank you so much for having me in. Wonderful to be having an audience with your uh, esteemed uh, guests and uh, uh, the doctors community out there. Thank you. So our next um, guest speaker is Dr. Rehan Saeed. And um, so he's also the um, consultant general surgery, um, the consultant general surgeon, the clinical lead HPB and abdominal multi-organ transplant surgery. He's recognized as having, having experience in transplantation um, surgery spans over 15 years and has um, over 40 publications. He's a trained and um, he's trained and worked in premier transplant institutes in the UK and other parts of Europe, USA, Taiwan, and India. He's had more than 300 kidney transplants, 400 liver transplants, <coughs> transplants, and both live donor and deceased donor, adult and pediatric including multi-organ transplant. So um, Dr. Rehan Saif, welcome to our series of webinar. Um, Hi, good evening. Um, am I audible? I'm fine, thank you. Now he's also um, coming all the way from India. So we actually are so privileged as having um, these two honored um, distinguished guests in our midst. So back to our discussion, um, excuse me, I'm just trying to have some up. So the question today, like I said, is um, centering on the kidney failure. Now let's look at, um, this is a very important topic because um, the, of the prevalence of kidney disease in the world. I actually did um, pull out some information here from the Milwaukee Nephrologist.net. Um, 
Um, just to see the, um, paint a picture of the significance of this discussion. You have over um, 850 million people in the world have chronic kidney disease. Now, if you consider that the world population is about 7.97 billion, we're talking about 10% of people in the world. Um, another fact here, chronic um, kidney disease affects around 10% of men and 12% of women on a global level. Another fact, only 37 million people have cancer, meaning 20 more times you have 20 more people have um, chronic kidney disease. So it is a, actually a very, very important um, topic of discourse here. And most times when we, um, this is a forum of um, physicians and people in the non-medical field. I know when we talk about kidney, the main thing that comes to our mind is, okay, the function of the kidney, it's the organ that helps us then urinating. But there's more to the importance of the kidney, we know. Um, it helps to eliminate waste products from the body. It also helps to um, produce hormones that are necessary for the production of red blood cells. It helps to maintain that internal balance, the homeostatic balance in the body, helping to maintain acid um, base balance. And also when we take in vitamin D, um, it's the kidney that helps us to process it in a form that is um, necessary, that could be available in the body. So back to our discussion now, we're gonna start. Um, the first question I will ask Dr. Venlaki, a kidney specialist. So can you tell us Dr. Venlaki, um, why the kidneys are so important? Many thanks for asking me that important uh, questions. Uh, yeah, so basically the kidneys are responsible for multiple functions. Although we recognize that, you know, making urine is one of the main functions which at a layman at a community level recognize, but kidney takes care of the whole milieu of internal, internal milieu to maintain the homeostasis in the sense like it's responsible for your fluid electrolyte balances, it's responsible for maintaining your uh, hemoglobins, it's maintaining your electrolytes, like your calcium, phosphate, metabolism. It's also responsible for maintaining the bone integrity as well by keeping the check on the various hormones responsible for the skeletal integrity. And it's also responsible to clean the toxins in your body on a day-to-day -day basis. So in a nutshell, it, both the kidneys take part on a day-to-day -day basis, filtering almost like 180 liters of blood. And then basically maintains the electrolytes, hormones, and the milieu interna in a very harmonious way. Thank you so much, Dr. Venlakin. So um, Dr. Saif, can you tell us um, the next question the, the patients really would want to know, um, what can we do to protect our kidneys? What are the kind of um, habits we can get involved in that will help to see to the protection of our kidneys? Dr. Saif, would you want to answer that? Yeah, I think um, probably, I mean, uh, this is a question uh, more suited to be directed to my nephrology colleague, Dr. Venkat. So he'll probably be the better person to answer that. Uh, Dr. Venkat, do you want to take? Sure, Ryan. Uh, all right. So this is basically uh, the biggest uh, culprits in, which are responsible for poor kidney health are uh, the lifestyle changes which are happening off late. So basically people are not hydrating themselves, the environment in which they are working, hot, humid, agrarian climates, and essentially smoking and uh, consumption of alcohol and essentially also taking intake of you know, the toxins, which could be either in the form of unnecessary use of pain medications, herbal drugs, or it could be use of antibiotics. So all of this will have some implications on the deteriorating of the kidney health. But the big elephants obviously in the room are the hypertension and the diabetes. So if you can take good care of your, you know, the diabetes and hypertension, and also take care of your uh, environmental and lifestyle hazards, like, you know, hydrating yourself well, keeping away from the toxins, keeping away from the herbal drugs, making sure, you know, you check with your GP on a frequent basis if you are prone to the diabetes and hypertension or come from a family which is having a family history of, you know, kidney diseases. So yeah, those will be my thoughts on that. Thank you so much for that, um, even that information. So um, yes, like I said earlier on, the 
um, essence of this having this forum actually is to serve as the patient advocate. So um, the question is going to be asked in such a, um, a very basic way, really. This is not going to be like the um, you know medical forum whereby you just have you know specialists interacting, but um, ideally we we're going to present this in such a way that you know information that the patients would want to know that they wouldn't have time to ask during that um, physician patient encounter in the um, office, it, this would be an opportunity to ask the question. So before I go on, I will also use this opportunity to tell our attendees here that if they have questions, they can actually forward these questions um, on the chat session. And um, towards the end of this um, series, these questions will be read out. And so our specialists here will address. Again, we are so privileged to have this distinguished guest speakers. And so I'll continue with our questions. Uh, the next question I'll be asking, again, to Dr. Ben Lackey, a nephrologist, a renal specialist. Um, what are the most common causes of kidney disease? Yeah, the kidney disease, essentially, we classify them as acute kidney injury and then CKD, which is, stands for the chronic kidney diseases. This is the two sides of the spectrum of the uh, kidney failure. So concentrating mostly on the chronic kidney disease, which, you know, enters into your body slowly, but then by the time you recognize that you are a victim of the chronic kidney disease, time has passed far, and then essentially you are looking into a very late stage of you know, the kidney failure. So the two big causes worldwide are diabetes and hypertension. So these are the two cause, the most common causes of the CKD, or what we call it as a chronic kidney disease. So the other causes being inheritable causes, like, you know, autosomal polycystic kidney disease, tubular interstitial nephritis, uh, renal stone disease, and, and uh, you also have certain diseases of the kidney which are associated with, you know, consumption of the environmental toxins like the pain medications, analgesics, herbal medications. And if people who are coming from an agrarian environment, we have this new entity called as the chronic kidney disease of unknown origin which is essentially basically use of the insecticides and the pesticides which are found there way into the water table. And then as a part of that, they reach into your system and then cause havoc. So in a nutshell, the two big things which we need to really focus to decrease the burden of the chronic kidney disease is the diabetes and the hypertension and living a healthy lifestyle and then keeping your obesity in check and then keeping away from smoking and then moderate consumption of liquor. So those would be the most practical advice I'd like to give this audience. Thanks so much for that information. So Dr. Velanti has actually given us a plethora of causes of, of kidney disease. So he highlighted the most common uh, diabetes and hypertension. And yes, we see in the um, clinic, the uh, common pathway to most of these um, disease, diabetes, hypertension, it all ends down to um, kidney disease, you know. So, um, so now that we know the causes, um, another question, the patient would want to know, how do I know I have a kidney disease? Because most times, um, and this is very typical with patients, um, except they are presenting for maybe an annual check, there's that tendency to present to your doctor, to present to the doctor when um, the patient feels sick. So, you know, you're having, um, you, you're getting tired, you know, or you're having a fever. But kidney disease, it doesn't come, it's, it's a very, um, it comes in, it, it, it does progress. You know, there's that um, nature about it that is a little bit um, not so um, obvious. So how do I know I have a kidney disease, Dr. Berlanti? That's a great uh question for me. Basically, she's right, the person who asked the question. So, kidney diseases enter into your body like a silent killer. And then by the time you realize, all the havoc have already been caused. So, it's very important to recognize it in a very early stage. Unlike the other organs like the brain and the heart, where if there is some sort of an ailment there going on, it's pretty much obvious. And then they go and seek help have a heart attack, you have a chest pain, you feel breathless, you feel tired, you feel in a perspiration, all those things are very instantaneous. 
and you feel you know breathlessness and dolorousness come very instantaneously so you seek for help the same is the story with strokes with the neurological ailments but unlike those things the kidney disease is unless 50% of both the kidneys are damaged beyond the stage of recovery first uh, symptoms are not manifested in fact your blood test only show up as abnormal only after 50% of both the kidneys are lost by the time you actually manifest the uh, the kind of you know the things like you know what you mentioned the tiredness the nausea vomiting dry skin and you know, a decreased urine output that means you are looking into a 20% remaining kidney by which you 70 to 80% of both the kidneys are lost beyond the stage of repair so it's very important to identify that so what i would actually strongly recommend and these are also the recommendations of the national kidney foundation in us is that every year annually you should visit your gp and then get your urine and blood test done especially if you are having you know the diabetes and the hypertension the urine to check for any abnormalities like you know are you having a little bit of you know protein in early stage which is a, which is the time when we need to catch you early to make sure that you know you don't slide down that pathway of uh, irreversible kidney damage are you having an early changes in your blood work blood biochemistry in the context of it, small elevations of creatinine sodium potassium so bicarbonates so all those things are the subtle indicators which we need to pick up early and then it's important to check your sugars if you have a positive history the diabetes has reached a pandemic levels and in african community especially hypertension and the, the diabetes are very notorious roughly it's estimated like 50% of the african populations have uncontrolled hypertension so which is a big cause for the contributor for the chronic kidney disease the same is the story for also the diabetes as well yeah so put it all in a nutshell yeah you need to visit your gp at least annually once in order to get your urine and blood work checked if and if you are at a risk of you know having you know the the ckd in the context of your anybody else in the family affected or if you have positive history of you know diabetes and hypertension probably once in six months Thank you so much for that, Dr. Benlaiti. So he, um, Dr. Benlaiti, has just um, reiterated the importance of having that annual check, you know, for um, that we pay to the, the the clinic or the hospital to ensure that um, um, these conditions are not um, creeping into our, uh, our system. Right? There's the, the need to have that um, check when you present to the doctor. They have the blood check, the urine check, doing the urinalysis. Checking for you know, evidence of um, um, particles in the urine, such as glucose, that might be an indicator of diabetes, or some other um, elements, and then also the blood check too. That will all this is, is screening for um, for the presentation of um, um, any early presentation of um, that could um, lead to kidney um, disease. So. Um, the next question, um, and um, let me remind um, our speakers that um, Dr. Venlanke is actually uh, a nephrologist, that's his area. So that is why most of these questions for now are actually being geared to him. Dr. Saif is also, um, is a transplant surgeon and he's a, 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 um, an abdominal um, transplant surgeon, but that oh, he also, um, so you have a multi-organ um, transplant surgeon in, um, HPB, um, hepatic, pancreatic, and biliary um, system, in addition to um, the organs, the other organs, um, the, including the kidney. So most of the later questions will actually be geared towards the side. Um, we'll continue with our questions. Um, next question is, um, um, we have been using the word um, CKD, or the acronym CKD, standing for chronic kidney disease. But let's go back a little bit and um, look at that term in general. Um, Dr. Velanke, can you tell us really? Um, yeah, CKD is a terminology which is used to define an irreversible loss of the kidney tissue. That is basically both the kidneys are having nephrons, which are the functional filtering units. Each of the kidney has a million or 1.2 million units of the nephrons. And these are very fragile units. And once they die, they do not regenerate often. Uh, so basically, we need to make sure that you know there are no toxins or the diabetes or the long-standing illnesses which are 
causing problems to those you know kidneys and we need to catch them early but if you want to have an exact you know the definition point by the kidney dialysis nation global outcome called as a kdico and all uh, basically it says that if you are having a kidney damage beyond 3 months of time either in the form of a structural uh, loss of integrity as evidenced by an ultrasound or some urinary abnormalities in the context of any blood in the cell blood cells or protein in the urine or the loss of the ability to maintain the osmolality in the urine or if you have an abnormal blood test like the raised creatinine raised uh, electrolytes or the, those things any of the functional or structural abnormalities in urine blood work or imaging as evidence by ultrasound for more than 3 consecutive months then you qualify for the diagnosis to be labeled as a chronic kidney disease or ckd yeah that means it's irreversible loss of the kidney function so there's a if it is for 3 months more than 3 months so there's that progression from um, the acute stage to the chronic stage once uh, you do not recognize an acute kidney failure at an early stage and you lose the window then you reach a stage of irreversible you know damage that's the reason why you need to seek help with the right people who are qualified to help you identify the cause and see if they are reversible or at least if they are not reversible to mitigate the damage and then prevent you from going into the dialysis and permanent loss of the kidney function Okay. Thank you for that information, Dr. Benaiki. So um, now that we know um, how we, um, the development of um, the processes that lead to the um, chronic kidney failure, um, could we talk about the? Can you enlighten us on, on the life expectancy of a patient with chronic kidney failure? Yeah, that's a good question. Basically, it depends upon the etiology of also the CKD. Say, for example, if you are having, you know, the diabetes, the diabetes, you know, doesn't cause only havoc in the renal problems in both the kidneys. It also has a it's a microvascular and a macrovascular in you know, the disease. Wherever there are blood vessels, you have a damaged blood vessels as a result of which the uh, end organs are also affected. It could be brain, it could be heart. It could kidneys or it could be any other organ in the body so if you are having about the diabetes it means the loss of the kidney function which is estimated once you start to have a diabetic you know, nephropathy that may is roughly around 6 ml loss per every year so but then uh, we kind of you know chart that you know deterioration and if it's a natural progression of around 5 to 6 ml then that's where you are uh that's where you are fitting into the natural decline but if you are losing the kidney function much more faster then we try to identify alternative causes by doing either a kidney biopsy or doing a more test in order to find out whether you have any other you know confounding etiology apart from diabetes and hypertension per se so yes so depends upon the cause of the ckd but being the most common cause is being the hypertension and you know the diabetes once you start early signs of identifying that there's a ckd because of if any one of these things enough to say that you know you start losing roughly around 6% per every year thank you so much okay so let's take um, a turn now dr saif <laughs> is very restless is a is an excellent colleague of mine we work as a team and then we we can't live without each other basically yeah. The, the the beauty about um the the, the in the medical field it's actually teamwork you know one person does this and the other person does that no one is alone you know it's a it's a a team of specialists um so yes um we have actually been talking about um kidney diseases and um there's a tendency at times to um use those words um interchangeably so we talk about ckd or ckf chronic kidney disease chronic kidney failure dr saif um is there can you tell us that fine line between um those terms chronic kidney disease chronic kidney failure is there a difference and can you tell us can you just um, um tell us more about these terms and how what, what the implication of these terms yeah there's uh 
uh, sorry, am, am I audible? Uh, I know there was some issues with audio before. Uh, yeah, there is absolutely a difference. Um, again, uh, when we say uh, um, chronic kidney disease, that just means that uh, there is a chronic disease process going on uh, with the kidneys. But when we talk about chronic kidney failure, that means we've reached uh, end organ failure where uh, the organ is not able to carry out its, um, um, its, its function and that needs to be um, you know, substituted with something else. Um, so th there is absolutely a difference. When we talk about chronic kidney failure, that means the organ needs support. Uh, and in terms of chronic kidney failure, uh, that's when we talk about dialysis. Again, uh, this is something that Dr. Wenkert can highlight on. Uh, but yeah, uh, a lot of patients who have chronic kidney disease still have some residual function not requiring dialysis, but it's at the point when they start requiring dialysis, that's when we would term it as uh, chronic kidney failure. That means it re it's reached uh, the point of end organ failure. Yeah, end organ failure, okay. So to add to that, uh, say basically based upon the geographical area where you have trained and where the patients are being seen by the doctors, these uh, terms were used interchangeably, CKD and uh, CKF. But I think now the national associations like the NKF, the National Kidney Foundation, and the AS and American Society of Nephrology, so all of them have now come to a conclusion that we are no longer going to use the CKF term, it will be only CKD, just to avoid any confusion. So I said everybody are all on the same page and we know what we are talking about. So we have replaced the term CKF to CKD, and it has got in a stage, a stage one to stage five, and stage six being basically end stage renal disease where we take up for the dialysis. So yeah, so CKD one, two, five, and six. Okay, so Dr. Velanke has just reiterated, yes, there are terms used interchangeably, CKD and CKF. Actually, it's a progression. So you have from stages one to six. And normally in medicine, when we're having that progression in numbers, the higher the numbers, the unfortunately, the worse the prognosis. So when we get to that stage of five and six, we're actually talking about end stage, which would, in former terms, we'll call the chronic kidney failure because it's like an irreversible stage at that point. So um, talking about um, the management now, and um, both teams here uh, 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 have their own um, specialty, Dr. Saif um, being a transplant, I know he, um, this is a, time he actually deals with most of these patients now when they get towards the end stage. So we talk about the management options of dialysis and um, transplants, right? So um, what is dialysis? Dr. Um, Saif, can you tell us about dialysis? What is dialy dialysis? Uh, again, sorry, I think this is, this is a question that should really be aimed at the <laughs> nephrologist. I'm, I'm Dr. Venkat's surgical colleague, so we can take that question together. Dr. Venkat, do you want to? Uh... So, yeah, so that's uh, the, usually the nephrologists are usually associated with this terminology called as the dialysis. So what happens is that, you know, as you go through the continuum of the kidney failure, what we mentioned from stage one to stage five, depending upon an individual, individual you know, uh, body habitus, it stage approaches where it becomes beyond one's you know adaptive compensatory mechanisms to pitch in. So you would require some sort of an artificial replacement of the kidney functions. So that is called as the dialytic modality of therapies. So usually when patients come to a stage of you know less than 10 or 15 percent of their kidney function, that is where their internal compensatory mechanisms are overwhelmed. And you come to a stage where you have nausea, vomiting, you're losing weight, you're having malnutrition, fluid electrolyte balances are all over the place, you're getting swollen, you're getting breathless, you're very anemic. So these are all the signs which indicate that, yes, now the time has come where we need to chip in, and then we need to start you on a thing called as a renal replacement therapy. Renal replacement therapy, that means is adding to what your residual kidney function is left after it has taken a PD. So if that comes in the form of you know, dialysis. Dialysis would mean hooking you up to an artificial kidney. Now the artificial kidney is a membrane. It comes uh, 
wherein uh, you try to filter your blood through a machine and that machine pumps into the blood to that filter and that filter you know, takes up all the toxins and regulates your volume and then it returns back a purified blood back to the body. So you need to do it on a continuous process that is called as a hemodialysis. And there's an alternative to that called as a peritoneal dialysis where you don't have to put the machine and basically your membrane inside your abdomen, inside your belly called as a peritoneum acts like that artificial membrane which is available in the hemodialysis modality filtering the toxins out. So yes, so in a nutshell again, the dialysis is an artificial modality wherein your blood is pumped in through a circuit and a filter to replace partly some of the functions which are natural organs do. And you need to do it as a continuous process and very typically patients are hooked up to the hemodialysis, do that weekly three times, four hours each time. And that actually translates to roughly around 15% of the kidney function what you have if you do three times weekly into four hours each time. So there you go, it's still not very adequate, but just enough to sustain life. Thank you very much, Dr. Ben Lackey. Um, he has just reiterated uh, what dialysis is. So we know the kidney, uh, one of its functions is to eliminate waste from the body. However, when it gets to that stage of um, that end stage and is unable to um, carry out that function, yes, um, dialysis becomes important as a modality of treatment. So um, we have actually talked about, you mentioned, um, um, the stages, you briefly mentioned those stages um, of the, the, the kidney goes through. And so the, the patients might also want to know, okay, uh, these doctors um, mentioned dialysis, they probably know someone that uh, has gone through or is going through that um, 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 modality of um, management now. So can you tell us really when, when is dialysis indicated? Because like you mentioned, um, kidney, the, 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 the chronic kidney um, disease itself, it goes through a stage. When does dialysis become something that you consider? Is it at that first stage or when? What, what kind of presentations do the patients present with when we recommend dialysis? Good question. And again, not a very easy one to ask. It's actually individualized and uh, personalized, you know, the decision. You're a nephrologist with whom you have been, you know, in touch, you know, who has been managing you through this you know, journey of the CKD for the various stages is the best person who would uh, take that call on a day-to-day -day basis when you see him. So there is no one size fits all kind of a thing. It's a very individualized and a personalized you know, the decision which is taken in conference with how the patient feels. And uh, when you have that you know, the dialogue, you know when is the time, the right time. In the past, uh, there was a misconception that you know early start of the dialysis actually translate to the benefits, but now we have enough data to say that that is not actually true, and uh, there is no benefit in starting the dialysis early. It has to be really an individualized you know, the, the decision. But broadly speaking, there are some absolute indications, and there are certain relative indications. The absolute indications are like, for example, say if you are having a lot of volume on your body, a lot of fluid in your body, which makes it that there's a lot of fluid in your lungs. There's lots of fluid all over your body, which is maintaining the blood pressure control, not very easy. Or if there are certain electrolytes, which are potentially life-threatening, like you know, high in potassium, very low uh, level of bicarbonate, a lot of acid in your body, you are uh, having the effect of this uremic uh, no, poisons on your brain, what they call it as a uremic encephalopathy, where you are having, not, you are having an altered level of, you know, consciousness, you are not bright, and your energy levels are come down. All these things are clues to say that now the time is right to start your know, dialysis. Otherwise, it's a personalized you know, call, and some people tolerate it pretty late. Some people would like to have it a little bit early. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, again, um, Dr. Venaki um, has um, talked about the um, question was uh, when is dialysis um, recommended? And it's really based on an individual, um, um, the, the doctor um, seeing that patient um, uses the discretion based on individual parameters, if I should use that word, right? And there are some absolute indications, obviously like um, fluid retention, there, um, 
retention of certain um, electrolytes in the body that could be toxic when um, uh, accumulated. So those are um, absolute. However, there are also relative um, indications. So dialysis recommended three times a week as a recommendation for maybe a period of four hours. And he also indicated, uh, talked about the various types of dialysis, both on the peritoneal and hemodialysis. So um, the question, next question, um, dialysis is an option, or it's, it's one of the um, management option, but also there's that um, talk about transplant too, the kidney transplant. So I think finally, Dr. Um, Rahim, <laughs> Let's talk about transplants. When do we now have that talk with our patient about renal transplant? Yeah, just carrying on from what Dr. Wenker just mentioned about the need for dialysis and what it does. He, he mentioned renal replacement therapy. I mean, in a nutshell, uh, transplant is the best renal replacement therapy. So once you get to a stage where, uh, you know, you've, you've reached your uh, CKD stage five or six, um, the only option is either dialysis or transplant. So really, uh, we should start thinking about um, uh, transplant, uh, not only when you get to a point where you require dialysis, but just before that as well. Uh, maybe later on uh, in this session, we can talk about, you know, what are the best results for transplant, about the timing of transplant. But yes, once you get to a stage where we know that the patient uh, is going to be requiring uh, dialysis. That's the point uh, to really start talking about uh, transplant uh, because both um, dialysis and transplant are a form of renal replacement therapy and the transplant is the better option. Uh, so that's the stage uh, really once, once you get to a point where uh, you require dialysis, that's when uh, you start thinking about uh, kidney transplant. Okay, yeah, and um, I, I, I actually have had that um, opportunity to manage, have had managed um, patients in the past that had, um, um, you know, that presented with this um, illness we're talking about that required dialysis. Um, and it, it, it is quite, um, it can take so much of a financial burden, even psychological burden. What are those, um, What's, um, how do you prepare these patients um, for these, this um, management? You know, um, so when we're talking dialysis, what are the most common um, concerns these patients express, you know, um, in, in the process of being managed um, via dialysis? Now, this is before we talk about um, transplant now. What, what, is the what, what talks do you give them in preparation for, you know, the dialysis itself, the, the, the course of um, dialysis they'll be having. Does that, do you understand the, the, the way I framed the question? I like that, Dr. Ben Lanky, you, you actually see most of these patients for dialysis. So what are the kind of talks you give to them when they present? Because this is gonna be, it's not gonna be like a once time session, like you mentioned, it's got, this is something that's three times a week. You know, there's, there's gonna be a lot of commitment on the part of the patient, you know, and depending on when they actually are, if they're going to opt for transplants, depending on when they're going to get that transplant, there's going to be dialysis. So how do you, how do they get prepared mentally for that? Um, great, great question, actually. Uh, basically, uh, I think it's very important to, for the patients who are having this CKD diagnosis to get in contact with the nephrologist. And very often we see that, you know, they come to the nephrologist quite late. And often it's a very you know, sad story that we end up seeing them in the ER rather than in a clinic when patients come up with no other option and then we have to just start the dialysis in an unplanned way. One of the biggest mortality causes is an unplanned you know, dialysis where they don't have access to the vascular access, they stick in a catheter, and then there's a lot of infection, bacteremia, and as a result of which you know, we are all living in hot, humid climates where you know, the catheter sites attract infection. So that's called as a crash start wherein patients come to the eMERGE, no other options left, no discussion happened, no education happened, and then essentially you are looking into a very you know, unfortunate story of, you know, you're going to lose this patient quite sooner or later. But on the other hand, if you had an early referral to the nephrologist, ideally at a CKD stage three level, then we need to plan the diagnosis, whether it's reversible or not. Having done that, if you are going towards a pathway of irreversible you know, the disease, then you need to have the discussion. 
what are the options you have so i look at it in optimistic way which organ failure has a practical replacement in therapy fortunately renal has that practical options it's not the end of the story it's actually the beginning of the next story so that's optimism so heart transplants are not easy there's nothing like a brain transplant then for renal there are options so but then you need to carry the journey forward with close collaboration with your nephrologist now putting the whole story into the context as to when you plan for a transplant versus on the dialysis yes so everybody needs to go through a patient education as to what are the options like what my good colleague you know rehan said kidney transplant is considered unanimously as the best modality to address the kidney failure the reason being is you know it straight away gives you much more function than weekly three times you know the dialysis and it makes you independent of the lot of the limitations which come with the dialysis like dietary limitations quality of the life financial burden there's a misconception that you know renal transplant is expensive versus remaining on the dialysis it's actually the other way around remaining on the dialysis is much more expensive on an annually when you are in a public funded program versus also in a private funded program kidney transplant is a one time investment it front costs a little bit but then afterwards maintenance costs are much much cheaper than remaining on the dialysis and the additional advantages of that is the high quality of the life the function you get back straight away 50% of the function versus you know remaining on the weekly three times on your machine you get up your 15% of the function which only gets worsened as the time progresses so yes the best modality of the treatment for the kidney failure is renal transplant all over the world there is no two thoughts about that it saves money gives a better quality of the life and uh, enhances your life span Thank you so much. You know, I've been so engrossed in this discussion. Actually, I've just noticed in questions on the stream, being prompted on the stream. So um, I need to recollect my um, thoughts a little bit. So I will call on a break so I can actually just, um, I see there are um, questions here. There are probably more questions. Um, um, Mr. Scott, can we go on a break? Is it possible? Um, yeah, we can go on about a five minute break. That should be fine. Okay, so let's just um, leave the room for a little bit and um, I can now, so I can just um, get to see um, the questions and um, we'll come back. We'll address more of um, the, this time around. We're actually going to focus more on transplant. There's just so much of questions there. We don't have so much time, so we'll join you guys. Um, so let's have a break. Concluding segment. Um, Scott, could we have those questions? Okay, yes. So we have two questions um, um, prompted here. Um, courage for weight management and fitness routine. Is there any truth in this lifestyle contributing towards increased kidney disease risk? I can't really see the end of the question. I hope I got that right. But um, so, um, Dr. Belanke, can you address that? Can you see the question more? Yeah. yeah, I think I got the picture basically, the question where it's coming from. So we, we are seeing this off late. There has been a change in the lifestyle of younger uh, generation people who are going into bodybuilding and physical, you know, fitness, you know, things. So I see in my clinic very often that patients who are indulging in an unsupervised, without any medical advice, indulgence in high protein intake, especially the protein, uh, like the 
animal protein and then there's a lot of you know stuff available in the market which is sold for uh, muscle building and it is also a lot of intake of uh, extraneous you know creatinine which is used for muscle building and along with that there's also abuse of anabolic steroids and pain medications together all of them they become a perfect storm and a recipe for the renal failure so i'm seeing this more of where younger generation people who are going to sort of you know gym work and taking high protein diet less of fluid in training aerobics are fine but weight training so these are all a perfect recipe for you know the disaster yes so to close that you know question yeah high protein intake with poor fluid intake lot of weight training uh, is a recipe for disaster in you know, the long run thank you so much and so important really because these days there's so much of emphasis on weight loss which is good because obviously we don't want our patients to be you know on that trend of um, obesity so we encourage but then again there's that um, culture of um, having so much of intake of products out there in the market, weight loss products. And like you said, some of these are infused with so much of stuff, <laughs> you say, you know, there's a need to also caution on the amount of protein because high protein without that um, fluid intake, adequate, you know, um, fluid intake will cause an imbalance that we don't really want because those could um, turn towards um, um, just this problem, create this problem. Okay, um, next question. Hmm. What causes stomach swelling in dialysis treatments? Is that something you observe? Dialysis treatments, stomach swelling? We see this uh, in patients who are not, you know, dialysed in a proper way. This is called as a nephrogenic ascites, wherein, you know, patients accumulate a lot of fluid, which is resistant to removal in spite of doing the dialysis later on. The important thing is to prevent the onset of this rather than address it once the thing has already been established because after that it's not very easy. You require more intensified dialysis in order to remove that fluid inside. That's basically because of the uremic toxins which are accumulated, which are having an inflammatory reaction on the peritoneum, which causes lots of you know, fluid accumulation. This is very resistant to treatment. Important thing is to make sure you don't let the fluid accumulate getting the dialysis in a very uh, monitored way in close consultation with your nephrologist rather than coming one day not to the other sessions, skipping your, the sessions or you know interrupting your sessions in between, not allowing you to uh, complete the full four hour sessions. So when you have those you know, non-compliance with the dialysis sessions, a point will reach where you develop this nephrogenic ascites. Once it sets in, then the only answer for that is more intensified dialysis, maybe weekly four times or five times. But the definitive treatment to control that or cure the stomach swelling on dialysis is a kidney transplant. Do a kidney transplant and within the first two weeks, all the treatment is gone. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you so much for that. So you just mentioned the kidney transplant and I think that would be a good segue towards that topic. Um, Dr. Sain, uh, Sain, sorry. When should we consider a kidney transplant instead of dialysis? But we did that. Did we address that earlier on? Yeah, we had we discussed that uh, earlier on. Uh, I mean, it's okay. We can just uh, summarize that. So essentially, when we reach a point where we need renal replacement therapy, that's when we should, um, you know, start thinking about a transplant. And like Dr. Venkat mentioned earlier. Uh, depending on the etiology, and if you think that this is the disease process is going to continue to progress and lead to a point where renal replacement therapy uh, would be required, that's the time to really start talking about a transplant. Okay. okay. So, I'd like to add to that, you know, basically you have to do a preemptive transplant gets you the best results. That preemptive, the term we use is even before starting the dialysis, if you go straight away into a transplant. If you are fortunate enough to find you a kind of a person who's willing to, to donate, a kidney, uh, donate a kidney, that would be the ideal case. So even if we're going into a the dialysis, going into a transplant, the results are the best. Uh, and uh, normally what we do is that we estimate the deterioration in the kidney function. Once your kidney function comes to a stage where you're left with your own 20 person, and you have a continuous progressive disease over the last six months, that means you have reached a stage and you qualify for a preemptive transplant. So, um, 
So who um something that also um comes a little bit of a challenge is getting that donor for transplant. So um Dr. Sai, who can donate? Uh, who can donate? Who, who, who is a suitable candidate for uh, a donor transplant? And then also, what are the risks for these donors? Yeah. So I think those questions are pertaining to what we talk about uh, live donor kidney transplant. So whenever we talk about organ transplant, uh, you know, transplantation needs human organs. So where do these organs come from? So organs essentially come from you know, two sources, uh, what we call disease donor transplant and then live donor transplant. So essentially a patient, uh, a, a person who is, uh, you know, brain dead, uh, the family can uh, donate the organs. Uh, so this is what we talk about uh, disease donor uh, transplantation, or we talk about live donor transplantation in the context of kidney transplant. Uh, you know, every person has two kidneys and if they've got two perfectly functioning healthy kidneys, um, only one is required to carry out your um, you know, daily bodily function and you can safely donate uh, one of the kidneys. So in terms of who can donate, um, uh, any person who is over the age of 18, uh, there is no upper age limit as long as you fulfill certain other criteria. So if you've got no major uh, comorbidities or no major um, other illnesses that would preclude you, preclude you from donating. And if your um, kidney function is normal, uh, you go through a rigorous uh, screening process to ensure that um, you know everything is okay. And then once you uh, clear the process and uh, then you can uh, donate. So basically anybody who's in good physical and mental health over the age of 18 can donate one of their kidneys to a family member. And, uh, and actually, uh, when we talk about risks of uh, uh, you know, donation, um, it's actually a very, very safe procedure because of the things that I just mentioned. It's a very rigorous screening process. And we're talking about healthy individuals. We're not talking about patients with any sort of disease. Uh, so the risk is actually much lower than um, anybody having a similar procedure uh, for removing a, a diseased organ. And in the context of uh, live donor kidney um, donation, live kidney donation, uh, the, the risks are much lower than, you know, essentially these are people uh, who are having a nephrectomy, uh, which is a donor nephrectomy, uh, which is removing one of your kidneys. Uh, so the risk is far less compared to somebody who's having the same procedure. Um, for example, somebody who's having the same procedure uh, for renal, renal cancer, for example. Uh, so it's a very, very safe procedure because you are uh, thoroughly screened uh, for uh, suitability for, for uh, donation. Uh, and it's only uh, one thing we do not compromise on uh, when we talk about live donors is the safety of the donor. That's the that's the most important aspect. So it is a very, very safe operation. Um, so anybody over the age of 18 can donate. Thank you so much for that information. Um, um, we see that um, he um, emphasizes um, it is a relatively safe um, procedure, um, having in mind the, 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 um, the function of the kidney it has a very extensive function and um, Apart from the function, it um, the it is able to um, adjust, you know, to the changes when, when there's a it, it's it's a safe it's a safe procedure, and we have two um, kidneys, so um, it's nothing that um, the donor should be worried about. And I know um, at times there's just that um, um, fear. If I give my kidney, I will, will I be able to survive? You no, know, the, the, the kidney it, it, it has a good um, uh, safety net, if I should use that word. Um, okay, um, let's look also at um, some questions here. Um, I'll continue here. That, um, the next question here, can a sickle cell patient do a transplant? Uh, anyone want to address that? Yeah. Go, go ahead, Rian. Yeah, I mean, the, 
the the short answer is yes uh, but there are uh, certain conditions and of course um, you know the patients who have uh, sickle cell disease um, have uh, have their own unique risks so they have to be thoroughly screened and and the risks of uh, a transplant are um, are greater than somebody who does not have the disease but then having said that uh, the risks of um, you know, continuing to remain on dialysis uh, are far higher uh, as compared to, uh, you know, undergoing a transplant. So although the, um, the mortality and morbidity risks are higher when compared to a standard transplant, uh, it is still uh, far higher um, when you do not consider transplant, but they should undergo, uh, uh, you know, a much more, um, uh, you know, rigorous uh, screening of their of their disease before you take it on. But it's not uh, so simple as that just because you have sickle cell disease, they would be denied a transplant. You want to add to that, Dr. Wanker? Yeah, so see, it's not an easy transplant because ultimately the sickle cell is a disease which is a spectrum, whether you are heterozygous or whether you are homozygous. So we do this, you know, the decision-making analysis, whether a patient is safe to undergo a kidney transplant in consultation with our hematology colleagues. So we have a very good backup in our institution from the hematology department, which are a state-of-the-art unit. They do a bone marrow transplant for the sickle cell anemia themselves. So we have that, you know, that discussion with the team as a multidisciplinary approach, and it, it's a spectrum really. If you're heterozygous, then probably, yes, we will take up, but if you're homozygous, then you stand a very extremely high chance of ending up with problems post-transplant. So it, they carry higher than normal risks of losing a transplant in a perioperative period. And uh, so the decisions are strictly individualized, personalized, are uh, taken as a part of a multidisciplinary approach. And then, uh, yeah, so that's where I leave it. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I hope that answered that question. It's um, it's not really a straightforward um, answer. The, the patient has to be individualized and also depending on um, the complications of that patient, right? I think that's the general gist of that. But yes, it, 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 they can either be a donor or a recipient, right? Um, okay, um, just a reminder here, um, there are vouchers um, appearing on the screen that um, patients can, uh, sorry, uh, our attendees can use for a free consultation with, um, with um, our specialist doctors here. So that is the, um, the giveaway here for our uh, um, attendees in appreciation of, for your attendance. So um, this, this topic actually is very, we can't really exhaust the questions. There's gonna be a part two of this um, obviously, and it's really gonna deal more on the transplant now. So we're talking about the management of kidney disease um, chronic kidney disease, we have different management options. Transplant is one of those modalities. And the next um, aspect or the next um, segment of this um, webinar later, that will be presented later, will be, it will, um, will emphasize more on the transplant, right? Um, do we still have time? <laughs> uh, do we still have time to um, accommodate more questions? Stott, would you, would you know if we have Yeah, uh, uh, if we could come to conclusions, that's okay. Okay, so um, thank you so much, um, um, Dr. Saif, Rehan Saif. Thank you so much for honoring this um, invitation. And Dr. Um, Velanki, all the way from India, um, they actually, um, um, though, um, they um, are in Abu Dhabi. I know you, you um, doctors are. Um... Yeah, we're based in Abu Dhabi at Bunjil Medical City, and we work as a renal tra transplant team. Dr. Say works as a renal transplant uh, surgeon, and I work as a transplant nephrologist. Thank you so much. So this is this has been. Thank, thank you for having us. Uh, thank you. Great honor to have um, this. Uh, distinguished presence in our midst here. Um, there was a, there's a little bit of slight technological mishap because I see I'm being introduced here as Dr. Dr. Chinyelu Menakaya, 
Of course, Chichi Menakaya is the brainstorm of these webinar um, productions. My name is um, Dr. Francisca Osagi. So that's a correction over there. We have that. Okay. So um, the next next week, we're going to be having another um, production. Um, we have um, the topic, I think, is on um, um, the body axis. We're going to be moving the body axis again. There's the emphasis on the BBL surgery. So uh, I will. Um, invite you um, uh, attendees for today to join us next week and then uh, we'll talk about um, we'll have um, the honor of um, um, having our guest speakers Dr. Tilo again, Dr. Maru and um, Dr. Sayel Benet, Benet for our next um, webinar series. Again, thank you so much Dr. Say, thank you Dr. Velanki for honoring this invite. Um, so um, I'm sorry um, Due to time, we're pressed with time here. We couldn't really accommodate all the questions. But like I said, this is just the first part of this presentation um, on um, uh, kidney failure. It is so much of a huge topic. And we can't really exhaust all the questions. We can't exhaust the presentations. But I promise you much more light will be shed on this in our next um, uh, uh, segment for this um, topic. So enjoy yourselves. Um, in um, this is the I'm in the US. It's just three over here in Eastern time, and um, I know in India it is midnight. Is it past twelve over there? I'm hearing. <laughs> so this is a global this is a global um, interaction because Scott's one of our hosts is also from is 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 airing this from London. So we're in three different time zones here: London, US, and India. <laughs> so wherever you are, enjoy yourselves this evening. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much forward to having you um, next time. So have a good one, everyone. Thank you.